a nice mix of um, backgrounds and stuff. And so, um, why don't we dive in? So, a little bit of history of Gym 5. So, this was started as, um, and most of what we're going to be talking about, the real basis is uh, the M5 simulator, which came out of Michigan, that was started in the early 2000s. Um, and then it, this was combined with Wisconsin GEMS, which GEMS was really focused on the coherence and caches. Um, and so we took the cache stuff, Ruby, from GEMS and kind of shoved it into M5 to create um, GEM5. And as you'll see, this is still kind of just shoved together. It isn't really as integrated as what the um, uh, vision was when this started. Um, so this is a relatively old project. It's been, you know, it has many years of history. Um, and I just want to briefly say that uh, the first author here, Nate Binkert, who really drove this project, um, unfortunately, you know, he, he's, he did a, a lot to make Gym 5 what it is today, but unfortunately he passed away last year. Um, and so, you know, we're thinking about him and his family, um, and it's really too bad that he's not with us anymore. Um, okay, so before I get started, I want to say this is all open source. All the material that I'm going to be covering today. Um, you can find out more information on learning.gym5.org. Um, that has both the tutorial information as well as um, the book. The book is all online um, on GitHub. And so if you see any mistakes, feel free to fix them and issue a pull request or open an issue and let me know about the mistakes. There are a lot of mistakes. I have not gone through and edited this particularly carefully. Um, and if you want to add something new, like something I haven't covered that you are an expert in, please let me know. I am very open to pulling in um, contributions from outside. Um, and you know, if you want to go back to your university and give this presentation to people at your, univers your university, that's great. I have a set of like 20 pages of notes to give the presentation with. Those are also all online and open as well. And this is um, licensed, uh, licensed under the Creative Commons, so you can use it for pretty much anything you want, as long as you say, Jason made this. Um, okay, so this tutorial is going to be interactive. We're really gonna, I'm gonna go through a lot of coding examples. Um, I personally learn through example, and so that's the way that I'm gonna be teaching this for most of the time. Um, the morning will be almost all code examples and we'll be doing a lot of coding together. In the afternoon, we're gonna get into some more complicated things like uh, coherence protocols and CPU models. That has too much code for us to write a CPU model in an hour. So we'll be looking at the code rather than um, actually writing it ourselves. Um, but everything's online, so if you wanna go through it yourself, um, you're welcome to do that. And please, let's, uh, ask questions. This isn't a huge group, and so you won't be interrupting much if you want to stop me and ask questions. Um, so briefly going through the schedule today, so we're going to do um, first part one, where we're going to talk about building Gem5, how to write configuration scripts for Gem5, what the user interface is, um, and then depending on time, possibly get to um, working on a simple sim object, which is actually in part two. Um, in part two, we're going to be talking about uh, how to use events and use the event driven simulation in Gem5, what sim objects are, how to create a sim object, memory system objects, and um, depending on time, hopefully we're going to get to writing an entire model of a cache, um, a simple cache in Gem5. Um, in the afternoon, I haven't completely decided what order I want to do this in. So in the book, it's Ruby, then CPU models, I think, we'll see how we're feeling. If we're tired of the memory system, we'll go to CPU models first, otherwise we'll do Ruby first. So we'll go over CPU models, the CPU models in Gem5, how Gem5 CPUs work, and look at an example simple CPU. Um, part three is all about Ruby and cache coherence. We'll look at a simple MSI protocol, simple MSI protocol. Um, how to configure Ruby, and a little bit on um, debugging as well. And then finally, after the second break this afternoon, 
we're going to have um, a session on Gen 5 best practices. So I have a couple um, talks from other people. Um, Ada is going to give a talk. Um, Ryota, who I do not see here, is going to give a talk as well. And I'm going to talk about how to contribute to Gen 5. Um, and then we'll end with an open forum this afternoon around 5 with some people, I'm gathering people from around the conference that I know have a lot of Gym 5 experience um, so we can answer questions about how we use Gym 5 or more general Gym 5 questions that we didn't get to cover today. So, uh, yeah. uh, as you said uh, about asking questions, so I have a few questions. Yeah. So I wanted to know if Gym uh, 5 fast is functionally correct. Uh, I have heard like uh, sometimes it's not functionally correct. Like people uh, advise to use off if I want to get faster simulation. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, I'll answer that in a second. Good question. Though. Any other questions before we dive in? Okay, so let's uh, build Gym 5 for those of you who have not done it yet. Um, so, um, first of all, does everyone have a laptop that works with Gym 5 or something you can SSH into? Does anyone not have a way that they feel like they can build Gym 5? Okay, um, so let's do this. Let's um, clone Gem5. So Gem5 is currently hosted at uh, gem5.googlesource.com. Um, and on Google Source, there's a number of different repositories. Um, and we're going to be cloning the public Gem5. Actually, um, and also, if anybody has trouble uh, with the Wi-Fi, I have a copy of this on a flash drive. If you need it. Um, okay. So as this downloads. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is check out a new branch so we can work on our own copy of the code and not mess up anything in case we want to push things upstream. So I'm going to check out a branch named Asplos because um, we're going to be adding some code. And then we're going to build Gem5. So we're going to build our build system is scons. In this case, I'm going to use eight cores to build it. Um, and then the binary I'm going to build is in the build directory. We're going to build x86, because I think we all have x86 machines in here. Um, and then build gym5.opt. And we'll talk about these parameters in a second. When you say when we have x86 machine over here, it doesn't mean that it's x86. It's just the simulated machine is x86. Yeah, so the simulated machine is x86, which since we all have x86 machines, is easier to use. So we can just compile binaries on our um, native machine and then run it in Gem5. If we, if we compiled the ARM version of Gem5, then we'd have to get a cross compiler to compile binaries that work with Gem5. Um, can you maybe say that it's not a problem with the support of different instruction sets? Yes. Is a good idea to use, which is not a good idea to use? Um, I will talk about that. I have a slide on that this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And one small question is, how, why have you advised to have thread number of threads more than one more than number of cores? So that's just the common thing you do with make and with GCC. So it's that some of that, when you're building, is I.O. dependent. So when you're stalling for I.O. on one uh, GCC, you can use, you can be using that core to compile. Just the make man page, I think, says use one more than the number of cores. Yeah. Um, so the first time you compile Gen 5, this comes up to say that you don't have the style um, commit hook. Make sure you add the style commit hook. Um, this will keep you, um, what's the word? Uh, it'll prevent you from making terrible style mistakes, which is just good coding practice. OK, so let's build this. Um, and this will take a little while. So, 
well, that's building, we can talk about what we just did. So again, we uh, checked this out. Um, we created a new branch, and then we started building. Um, so if we talk about this, so we use the scons make system. Um, so scons, just briefly, is very powerful in that all the build files are just Python, um, but it's also very confusing because they're weird Python. It's strange. Um, so then the second parameter that we pass to scons is what we want to build. Um, and we're building the .opt parameter. Or dot, yeah. So we, um, yeah, that build thing, the scons file interprets that and builds the target for there. Um, so the second parameter we passed is a little bit magic. So this tells scons all the default values to use. And if you look in um, Gem5 build ops, there's a bunch of files there. You can use those file names as that thing between build and Gem5, and that'll build with those defaults. You can also pass those defaults on the command line to scons as well. And we'll see that this afternoon when we look at Ruby. What? I'm sorry? Oh, instead of path? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, okay, and then to answer your question about opt. So opt is the one that is really most commonly used when you're developing with Gem5 because it's relatively fast and it also has all of the debug features built in. So it allows, it has, it compiles with debug flags so you can use GDB and it also compiles with all of the dprintfs, all the debug print statements which we'll um, look at later. Um, fast gets rid of all the debug flags and also um, compiles out all of the asserts. So if you, or in, in panics um, in Gem5. So if there is a bug in your code that you have an assert or panic to check and you run fast, that a certain panic won't happen if there's a bug. But if there isn't a bug, then it will run much faster with fast than with opt. And it's also a much smaller binary. The opt binary is like 300 megabytes. The fast binary is like 50 megabytes. So, you know, what I, the way I develop Gem5 is I'm usually compiling opt every time while I'm working on my problem. If some really weird bug comes up, then I'll switch over and do debug so I can step through it in GDB and not have all, all the optimizations. And then once I have my thing working, my model working, and I want to run it, say I'm sending it off to some compute cluster to run a thousand simulations, then I'll compile fast and simulate um, with all those. So that's usually the way I do it. So fast can have bugs in it, and you won't see them. I was just concerned of the case that it works in off but if I switch to fast? If it works in opt, it should work in fast. I mean, except for weird things if you have like a memory bug where having the debug flag or the um, debug symbols somehow messes up your memory bug and makes it work with debug symbols, but then it doesn't work with debug symbols. If your code is bug free, fast is fine. No code is bug free, though. So. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions there? If you're not making any code changes, fast is probably safe. Yeah. Um, but I guess I would really say use fast if you're simulating, like for your experiments that you're running, you can use fast. For all the stuff setting up experiments, I would use opt. Okay, so the architecture of Gem5. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about sim objects, and almost everything in Gem5 is a sim object. And all of these C++ objects in Gem5 inherit from the sim object class. Um, and what the sim object is representing is some physical component in the system. And these, we'll see these sim objects are really powerful. You get to configure your system with the sim objects. Sim objects can use the um, discrete simulation infrastructure as well. 
Um, so Gem5 is a discrete event simulator. So what it does is it has an event queue. You pull events off of the event queue. You execute these events, which can generate other events that then go back onto the event queue. And then time is stepped to whatever the current time is at the head of the event queue. So I think this was at time 10. Now, once this event is done, we're going to go to time 11. Execute that event. Once that event is executed, we'll start, we'll move time to time 20. So it's just a discrete event simulator. Um, and as, a, as you implement a sim object, you can use this event queue. You can schedule things on the event queue if you have a sim object. Um, and we'll cover more about how to schedule events um, probably after the break. So, any questions? So far. Great. Okay, so let's talk about configuring, configuring Gem5. So, what is Gem5's user interface? Those of you that have used Gem5 before, what would you describe as the user interface? The command line. Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of like, usually the way that I've seen Gem5 used is you have a ridiculously long command line <laughs> to give all the parameters to it, and then you look at the output file. Yeah. Well, that's not Gem5's user interface, and I want to drive this home. Gem5's user interface is Python. You write a Python script to configure Gem5, and then you get output. Th this is really the user interface is through Python scripts, and it's incredibly um, powerful if you're um, using it correctly. It, it, it can also be a little confusing, but ho hopefully after we go through this, it'll be clear. So these Python scripts define the system that you're trying to model, and it also defines how to run that model as well. Um, and the really cool thing about Gen 5, and this is what, um, you know, the way that Nate built this originally is that all of these C++ objects are exposed to Python as Python objects. So you instantiate them in Python, and then they run in C++. So you get the expressiveness of Python with the speed of C++. It was really a brilliant design. So let's make a configuration file. Um, we're going to first create a really simple system that has a CPU, it has a memory bus, and it has a memory. So basically the simplest computer system you can imagine. Or at least the simplest one you can build in Jim Um so let's look at what this code is going to look like. And in the meantime, Gem5 has compiled. This is good, a good sign. So I'm going to make a new file or a new um, directory inside configs called tutorial. And then I'm going to make a new file, configs, tutorial, simple.py. So this is just a Python file. The first thing we're going to do is import the M5 um, Python um, library. And from M5 objects, we're going to import all of them. So M5 objects will import all of the sim objects that we've compiled with Gem5. So we compiled Gem5, we have a bunch of sim objects. We're going to import them all into this Python namespace. So now the first thing we're going to do is create a system. We're going to instantiate this system object. Now on this system object, we need to set up a clock domain. The system is clocked at something. So we're going to set a clock domain to be I'm going to set this to be one gigahertz. Um, capital H. So you can set this to be whatever you want. It could be a megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz, two gigahertz. Um, and you can use these common um, English, well, not English, but uh, the whatever units, you can just write it in. Um, simple, yeah. simple question. Do you really use uh, Bing or BI to, to the digital code? <laughs> uh, I use it. 
No, I, I, I use it, I use Beam, but uh, the thing is, I'm using Beam and Grab and yeah, yeah, like yeah. that to, to in, uh, but I'm not that happy with that with Gen 5. That's a really good question. What uh, kind of uh, development environment to use? Um, so today I'm going to use Vim because I'm SSH down to um, uh, one of my servers. But usually I'm using some other kind of editor. So I use um, Atom.io, GitHub's editor that they have. But it's just a text editor. And then I have terminals that I use Grep and stuff on the other side. I don't use an IDE. I have heard people set up Gem5 with IDEs. It's not something that I have done. Yeah, but it's mostly, I mostly just use the text, whatever text editor I'm comfortable with. Um, yeah. Okay, so we instantiated a clock domain, and then we set the parameter of this clock domain clock to a gigahertz. And then the other thing we need to do with the clock domain is, um, Set the voltage. Um, the voltage is required because it's a required parameter, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, but it's only used when you're using the power model, um, which is not particularly well <coughs> implemented throughout Gen 5 yet. Okay, so now that we have a clock set up, we are going to set a couple other parameters on system. We're going to set the memory mode to timing because we want to measure the timing of this system and we'll talk more about memory modes later. And the memory ranges for the system, we are going to have one, one address range, physical address range, and it's going to be half a gigabyte. Now we can create a CPU. For now, we're just going to use one of the simple CPUs, a timing simple CPU. This afternoon, we'll look at how to build our own CPU model as well. Um, so we have the CPU part of our system. Now we're going to do a memory bus. For that, we're going to use a simple crossbar for the memory bus. Um, and then now we just connect the CPU to that memory bus. So system.cpu.icache port is going to be connected to the memory bus. We're also going to connect the decache port to the memory bus. And so we'll, we'll talk more about this um, later, but these ports, when you say equals another port, in the background this connects these ports together. And we'll see how that works. Um, a little later. Um, now, since we're in x86 and everything's more complicated in x86, um, we have to do a couple of other weird things. Create an interrupt controller, system, CPU. What? You're missing a U there and you interrupt. Thank you. connect up these interrupts correctly. This actually is slave over here. And then the We're going to set up these other ports, and most of this is just for um, functional correctness of the system. Um, it's kind of too bad that this isn't automatically set up for us. But. Okay, so now we have a CPU, or we have our whole system. We have a CPU that's connected to a memory bus. So what we're missing is a memory controller and connecting the memory bus to that memory controller. So we're going to create a memory controller.
So we're going to use DDR3, 1600, um, an 8x8 configuration. We are going to set up, um, tell the system that we're going to use the same memory range for this memory controller as our um, system's memory range. and finally connect the memory bus to this memory controller. So now we've set up the system. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a simple way to visualize the, the address ranges that you will assign? Because I had some problems that are ready with the uh, I can't think of any way to simply visualize the address ranges. You kind of just have to go in and look. Um, either look at the configure like the config.ini file and see what the ranges are or something like that. Um, they can actually get pretty complicated because you can have interleaved ranges um, and many different ranges all over your physical address space. So. In my case, my starting point was uh, a script, like an example, and then uh, a system was already configured with uh, many ranges, and then I could not put mine in a way that fit. Yeah, that's um, uh, setting up the ranges can definitely be a pain. I agree. <laughs> I don't have any easy, easy answer for you. Um, okay, so now we've created our system. The next step is to create a workload to run on our system. So to do that, we are first going to create a process. Um, we're going to give this process a command. So this is similar to what the command you would pass on, um, just run it, a command line would be. Um, so we're going to run a test program. which hopefully I've typed correctly. So there is a few tests, um, test programs that are distributed with Gem5. One is just a simple hello world program. And then we are going to set the CPU to execute this process. Um, and the last thing we need to do is tell the CPU to create the physical threads, the physical execution threads um, to run this process. So now we have a process to run. And then the last thing we need to do is set up our simulation environment. So to do that, we have to create the root object of the simulator. We are not going to be using full system. So we're going to set that to false. Um, set the root, the system of the root to system, the system that we created. Um, and then call M5 instantiate. So M5 instantiate, what it's going to do is when it gets here, is going to go through everything you've created off the root. So we have root system, the system has CPUs, the CPUs have a workload, and so on. And it's going to go through that object hierarchy and actually construct the C++ objects. So up until this point, we've just been working in Python. Once you do M5 instantiate, you now have all the C++ objects um, created. So now that we have the C++ created, um, objects, we can, we're in Python, so we can kind of do whatever we want. So let's print that we're beginning. <coughs> print beginning simulation, and by the way, a few weeks ago, maybe not even that long, um, we switched from using Python 2 style print statements to using Python 3 style print statements. So you now have to use um, parentheses with your print. You have what? You Thank you. Um, so we're going to begin the simulation and then actually run the simulator. So 5simulate kicks off the discrete event simulation. 
It's going to pop things off the whatever's on the event queue is going to start popping them off and run until um, it gets some kind of event which causes it to exit. Um, there are a number of different kinds of exit events. Um, the one that I think we'll see is that all the threads have finished executing. And when, when it gets to this exit event, so there's an event on the event queue that gets popped off. It's an exit event. It will just kick back out into Python. So when it kicks back out into Python, we are going to print something else. Exiting at tick. Because. So, Gem5 will be slightly annoyed with you if you do this because we are past the 80 character limit. So, you can also do something like that to prevent yourself from going across the 80 character limit. Okay, so if everything went well, we can now run this config configuration file. So, we have our Gem5 binary at build x86 gem5.opt. Um, and we pass in as a parameter this configuration file that we just wrote. Great. So it actually worked. So we run Gem5. We printed. We printed beginning simulation from Python. Gem5 tells us we're entering the event queue at time zero. The the program printed hello world that we ran, and then we we printed exiting at this tick. And the reason why we exited was the last act of thread context finished. Any questions? Yeah. Um, the simulation itself only runs single core, does it? Uh, the way that you mostly, it only runs single core. There's some specialized. The discrete event simulation has support for one event queue per thread and for multi-threaded event queues, or multi-threaded event simulation. That doesn't, that's not really supported by any sim objects, except in very specialized circumstances. Um, yeah, so it's mostly just single-threaded. But there's no reason that it has to be single-threaded. Just no one has spent the time to make it multi-threaded yet. Yeah, this, this, this was one of the problems yeah. I had. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a warning. So the DRAM device, um, we chose a, a DDR1600 8x8, right? And so that DDR DIMM, if you're 8x8, has a capacity of 8 megabytes or 8 gigabytes. That's what the DDR DIMM does. But we set the address range to only 512 megabytes. So the actual physical device does not match the address range that we did. So since it doesn't match, you could potentially get wrong timing. Usually it doesn't matter. Uh, but the timing won't be exactly so right. As long as we don't set it like open to the table. Uh, as long as it's not important to you to have precise timing, well, like the, that the device matches it. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you want more than eight gigabytes, you should be using a different DDR3 device, or you should be using two channels. Um, but that's really just a warning that's in there and it's not, it's more helping you simulate realistic systems, not so much like you're gonna get wrong answers. Good question. Okay, so we um, created this simple config script, which if you look at um, configs learning gem five, you'll see the same config script that we just wrote, but with more comments. Um, and a couple other comments here. So this is the binary we want to run that could be could have been dot fast or dot debug if we'd built those. Um, and then again, you know, this interface isn't so much the command line. The interface is this script that you passed to Jim Five. Uh, and you can do some really powerful things with these scripts. All right, so I want to mention a couple of things about the port interface. So these, oh yeah, go ahead. So uh, as you mentioned, that interface is not command line but Python script. Yeah. But if we want to have different configurations of the parameters, uh, 
uh, we want to uh, sweep a space mm -hmm. of parameters, then is it possible to pass it? You can absolutely way? pass in parameters to your Python script. I mean, then we have to use command line to pass in, but can a config script itself be modularized? That yeah, yeah, config scripts can definitely be modularized so that they run different mm -hmm. things. So, so what I'll often do when I'm running you know, when, when I'm running experiments and I want to run a bunch of different configuration files, I make my um, Python config file, which is general, and then it takes one parameter, which is the configuration to run. And then I'll launch all my jobs with a different configuration for each one. Or maybe it'll take two parameters, the configuration and the workload, something like that. And then I'll sweep through all that. Um, I mean, essentially, it's like, you know, since you get to build these Python scripts, you get to choose whatever the best interface for your experiments are through the Python script. But it's all in Python, which means it's easy to write. Easier than C++. Um, so memory objects, so for instance, the CPU connecting to the Membus, um, these are, we use the master-slave port interface. Masters send requests to slaves Slave res slaves respond to masters. Um, so that's how you can remember which is which. Um, they don't have to have the name master and slave. Uh, for instance, the iCache port is a master port. Uh, and it needs to be connected to a slave. And you'll get an error if you try to connect a slave to a slave. Um, and this equals sign is pretty cool. Um, you just say equals in Python, under the hood, it calls all these C++ um, functions to hook them up correctly. And we'll see more about these later. So then we use syscall emulation mode here, which was not full system mode. Um, full system mode is running Gem5 essentially like a hypervisor or like QEMU. Um, it uses full emulation to do it. Um, but in SE mode, we're not, we don't have an OS or anything like that. Um, so we have to create this emulated process. I'll talk a little bit more about um, exactly how SE mode works after we see how ISAs and CPUs work. Uh, how complete is the syscall implementation? Uh, it's okay. okay. It can run pthreads okay. now. Um, but it's not I would suggest everyone uses SE mode for testing things and then full system mode for actually doing simulations. Mostly because I personally believe that the operating system has a significant effect on our architecture. Um, and so by ignoring it, I think you're ignoring important things that you would um, not ignore otherwise. And also SE mode like doesn't emulate TLBs or simulate TLBs, whereas full system mode we do. TLBs. So there's modeling questions of using SE mode. So full system. Yep, so we're full system is simulating the full system. Syscall emulation mode is emulating syscalls. Yeah, well, but it, it doesn't. Yeah, no, you can do a system. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can run, a, for example, a ARM system on a... Right. Right. That's KVM, that's something. That's the virtualization feature. Okay, so any other questions about that simple script? Cool. Okay, so let's... Um, let's see, what did I have here? So... Let's look at a slightly more um, complex um, script to add caches. So rather than just having our CPU directly connected to the Mimbus, we're going to add two levels of caches in between. Um, and rather than going through this, these details, we're just going to look at some of the code. So if you look at um, configs, learning Gem 5, part 1, so there's two level.py, which this has lots of comments in it. Um, 
most of this is the same as before, except it allows us to run any binary. The interesting part is here. So after we create our CPU here, we take the we create these caches. And we'll look at um, what these are in a second. So we're going to create other Python objects and connect them up as caches. We're going to connect the ports here, and then. create a L2 cache, this L2 crossbar, and then finally we have our memory bus down here that we're going to connect the L2 cache to. So we essentially just created everything that was in that picture and then connected it up. Um, and then if we look at caches.py. So this is where we defined these cache objects. And so, again, one of the things I really want to drive home is that this is just Python. So we can use all of our object-oriented Python code to create these um, configuration scripts. So for instance, here I created an L1 cache class. And we'll look at uh, these parameters in a minute. Um, create an L1 cache class that has functions that I defined. So for instance, connect bus. And then here I defined a connect CPU, but this is an abstract class. So for the iCache, connect CPU connects to the iCache port. For the dcache, it connects to the dcache port. Um, so you really just get to use Python however you want. So then one of the questions that people often have is, you know, I had to define all of these parameters here for these caches. So where did these come from? How did I know that I needed to define size, associativity, tag latency, and so on? So how I knew that was I am extending the cache object. And so if we look at in source, there's a Python file in source. And we'll talk more about this in a bit. But this is what I like to call the sim object description file. So this describes a sim object. Um, and the sim object has a bunch of parameters, things like the size, associativity, tag and data latency, and response latency. And these parameters are what we need to make sure to define in our configuration file. So we have this sim object description file in source that tells us what the parameters are to the sim object. Then in our configuration file, we set these parameters. Um, and you can override them, override the defaults. So in this case, write buffers has a default of eight. So you can override that with your own default. Um, things like size actually don't have any default, so you have to define a size for the cache. And when we create a sim object here in a minute, um, I think this will become a little bit more clear. Um, OK, so we can also run this two-level um, example. It also runs. Now this has some parameters with it. So I created these parameters just by using opt parse in Python. So I just added these parameters to my Python script. Um, and so I can say change the um, L1 D size to, let's see, the default's 64. Let's change it to two kilobytes instead. So when I ran with 64 kilobytes, it took five, 58 microseconds. 
if I run with a two kilobyte, it takes 59 microseconds. So it turns out that the L1 cache does not affect the performance very much for Hello World. If going to down to a two kilobyte cache still takes good. Oh, only made it go up by like 2%. So this is um, how I would kind of do an interface for performing different um, um, experiments. And importantly, like I would make pr command line parameters only for things I want to change. If I don't want to change it, there would no, be no parameter for it. Um, okay, any questions? Okay. Um, so again, this is, you know, I, I strongly encourage you to um, use good object-oriented design in this. It makes it, when you start running your experiments, to uh, much easier to pick up and go. Um, so again, this is just Python. You know, debugging these configuration files is really easy. Just throw in Python print statements. They're perfectly legal and they work. Um, or there is support for using the Python debugger PDB as well. I've never actually tried to use it, but I think it exists. Um, in the text of the book has details about how to add command line parameters as well. Okay, so let's look at Gem5's output. So if we look at M5out, we have three files, config.ini, config.json, and uh, stats. So the config.ini is a particularly important file because this dumps, when you do m5 instantiate, it dumps the config.ini. So that shows you exactly what all the parameters are when you're running gem5. So if you ever have a question of, I'm not sure what default parameter this sim object is using, you can look at the config.ini and see the exact value. And we'll look at an example in a second. Uh, the JSON file is the same as the INI file, except in JSON format instead of INI format. Um, and then stats.txt gives you all of st the statistical output. Um, I really, really hope we revamp stats.txt into a better stat system. If any of you want a great project, rewriting the stats file or rewriting the stats output from Gem5 is like, Number three on my list of really important things to do in Gen 5. Um, the, other the other two are rewriting all the config scripts and actually getting regressions working. <laughs> Those are the three tough things that, that, that I want to see. Okay, so let's look at these files real fast. Um, so in M5out, we have actually this has a few more files. Um, it has these dot files, which are actually pretty cool. Um, Unfortunately, let's see, I'm SSH'd in, so we can't look at them. But the if you're on, on your local machine, you can open, and you've installed PyDot. Um, you can open this config.pdf, and it actually shows you graphical representation of the system that you're simulating. So it's another good way to, especially when you start doing more complex systems, see how everything's fitting together. And if we look at the um, you know, the config.ini, say we look at the um, memory controller, this shows us every single parameter of this memory controller and what the value is. So if you wanted to know, you know, what all these different these are all the different power parameters of our DDR3 controller, or Here's all the timing parameters for a DDR3 controller. So all this stuff is in, like, as defaults in the um, sim object description file. Um, but here you can see what they actually are when you're running. And of course, if we look at the stats, this gives us information like, you know, the total amount of time that it took to simulate, which was 59 microseconds. Um, the, these first things are all general, um, global stats, which annoyingly are sometimes not exactly what you expect. 
So like these host stats are actually giving you information about the performance of the simulator, not the performance of the simulated system. Um, let's see what else is interesting in here. So we also have, so if we scroll down some, Okay, the memory controller. Here. So the memory controller tells us the, you know, average memory access latency. And the bandwidth of the system was 390 megabytes per second. So we did not get very good bandwidth utilization out of our peak possible of 12 gigabytes per second. Um, this workload was not very bandwidth, uh, didn't require much bandwidth. So these kinds of things, um, you know, and, uh, again, I would really like to see this rewritten. Right now, if you want to get these statistics, you often have to write your own text parser to parse this text file to pull them out, um, which is a pain, but that's the way it is right now. Uh, so if you, so you need to install um, in uh, in Ubuntu. It's install Python PyDot. I have no idea what it is on. It automatically detects it. Yeah. Or it tries it tries to dump it every time, and if it gets an import error, it doesn't dump it. Okay. That's the way it works. So it would be great to have such a warning that you have if you don't have certain libraries to have it because this one would really help me if I didn't know that it existed. That's a good point. You should uh, write a patch to do that. <laughs> I will when I find the time. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a small request. Yes. Uh, can you show what's the command, sudo command there? Oh, to install PyDot? Yep. Okay. So we talked about the simulation. Um, so sim objects can have stats. So every sim object can have its own stats, and you can register stats, um, create new stats. Um, okay. Let's see. In the, I will briefly look at some of these example scripts. So what a lot of people use um, when running Gem Five is in configs example, there are fs and sc.py. These, I believe that the thought when these were created was this was an example of how to write a Python script, similar to my simple.py that we just went through. What it has grown into is scripts that allow you to do every possible thing with Jim 5. Um, and they're just, in my opinion, a mess. Actually, but that's the reason why I said I used the command line because right. I used the fs.py and all just adapted it a little and then put anything I could over command line. Yeah, and, and you know I say it's a mess because if you look at <laughs> um, example. It's yeah. yeah, it's impossible to tell what's going on, and there are an innumerable number of options. So, for instance, and and so if you ever do use sc or fs.py, be really careful. Make sure that you understand these options because if you look at, um, if you don't use minus minus caches, your system won't have caches. If you don't use minus minus L2 cache, your system won't have an L2 cache. So you have to have that parameter to have a reasonable system. There's this parameter L3 cache size. It does nothing. It doesn't create an L3 cache. It's just there for some reason. Um, let's see, what else is... Um, yeah, and most of these you don't need. I don't know what a lot of these do. Um, 
Yeah, they just go on and off. So. Yeah. Because I went through the code. Um, and trying to trace through the code of these is just incredibly difficult. So really what, what I would do is I would look at, so if we run this, um, let's see, I want to run tests, test prog, um, hello, Ben, Lin, x86, Linux, hello. Um, Nope. Okay, so I run uh, hello, similarly. So what I would do is, if I ever do use this, you can run it and then look at m5out um, config.ini to actually see what ran. So for instance, one of the things you notice is if we go to the CPU, um, The CPU doesn't have any caches. So we weren't running with any caches. So it's a good idea if you're using scrfs.py to at least go through the config.ini and make sure it looks like what you're expecting. OK. So we are 15 minutes away from a break and finished up with the first part. Well, uh, so are there any questions here to this first part so far? Yes, is there any documentation, like uh, further documentation about the, the same object? Because okay, every object is a same object, right? So same object seems to be like a part. Yeah. I, I saw here in the code that it, uh, uh, it's a class that uh, inherits, inherits from even event manager, uh, serializable and uh, gradable. I don't know less what they are, but Serializable is so you can dump checkpoints. Mm -hmm. You can dump it to a checkpoint. Dump it to a checkpoint. Okay. Checkpoint. Yeah, you can serialize it to a checkpoint. Yeah, so serializable is for checkpointing. Drainable is um, to stop the simulation and then be able to pick it up again. So uh, we won't look at that. But that's something you can do is you can, you can exit the simulation. And when you do that, drain the simulation, change things around in the system, and then restart simulation again, which is very useful. You can like switch CPUs out. So you can run, you can fast forward with one kind of CPU, say Atomic, then switch in a timing CPU, and then continue executing. So that's what drainable is for. Yeah, I'm doing such a question because we, we said you said we have this time. Yeah, yeah. So that's why. Uh, it's a little bit of a context. But okay, then the, the initial question was there is some further documentation of the topic or the only ways to go through the code. Yeah, the only way to really understand them is to go through the code. Some of those are documented. So if you look at um I think Jim5.org slash docs. Yeah, and like it, so some of them are commented in Doxygen. Um, not all of them, though. Yeah. Sometimes there are like consistencies 